Thank you for visiting this video of St. Luke United Church of Christ in Beecher, Illinois. I'm Tom Ewing, the pastor here. <clears throat> this video contains the focus scripture lesson and the message that will be delivered later this morning at 1015 in the sanctuary located at 725 Penfield Street. The worship service will be recorded and placed on our church's YouTube and Facebook pages and should be available by mid-afternoon. We hope you can join us in person later this morning, but if not, thank you for spending time with us on the internet. The focus scripture lesson this morning is from Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other, and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and mother figures in the congregation this morning. Parents, both mom and dads, have the hardest job in the world, and this world would be in a horrible shape without their love and sacrifice and perseverance. Of course, it's not easy to be a mom. In a TikTok video, a woman named Nicole DeBroy explains one of the challenges of motherhood. She said, my kids wanted to know what it was like being a mom, so I woke them up at 2 a.m. to let them know my sock came off. Another mom on Twitter wrote, parenting is 70% me yelling, 20% asking the kids why they're yelling, and 10% trying to find where I left my coffee. Speaking of misplacing your coffee, here's one mom's recipe for iced coffee. She writes, have kids, make coffee, forget you made coffee, put it in the microwave, forget you put it in the microwave, finally, drink it cold. That recipe for iced coffee alone tells us a lot about the challenges and sacrifices of motherhood. So we thank you, moms, for your dedication to raising the next generation. I don't think you can overestimate the influence of a parent on a child's sense of compassion. And compassion is what being a follower of Jesus is all about. Compassion is concern for the suffering of others. It's an active response to another person's pain. Compassion is at the heart of our lesson for today. Some people seem gifted with compassion and some not so much. One woman tells of falling flat on her face in December in the middle of an icy but busy parking lot. As she was lying there trying to clear her head, another woman drove up and called out the window, are you hurt? No, I'm fine, the first woman answered. Oh good, the second woman continued. Will you be leaving your parking space now? A driver's compassion was as short-lived as a hummingbird's hiccup. In contrast, a South Carolina teacher named Trevor Barton tells of a memorable event that occurred in his first grade class. Most of Barton's students come from underprivileged homes, and one of his students, named Paola, lives in a small apartment with her grandmother, mother, sister, and uncle. Paola's family are immigrants from El Salvador. One day, a new boy named Billy was assigned to Barton's class. As Billy sat down, Paola leaned toward him and whispered, Hi, I'm glad you're in our class. Don't worry, there's lots to learn. I'll help you. Later that day, Mr. Barton asked Paola why she wanted to help Billy. She said that she remembered how it felt to be the new kid in school, and others had been kind to her. Then she added, I just wanted to be kind to him. He's my neighbor. The fir that first grader understood about compassion. One child reaching out in kindness can make a big difference in the world. Our world has a desperate need for compassionate people, people who will reach out with kindness to meet the needs right in front of them. Elton Trueblood is a former chaplain at Harvard and Stanford universities. In one of his books, he shares a letter from a young woman he knew. I'll just read a few quotes from her letter. She wrote, I've often realized that it takes courage to care. Caring is dangerous. It leaves you open to hurt and to looking like a fool. 
I have found many places in my own life where I keep a secret store of indifference as a sort of self-protection. That's interesting, don't you think? A secret store of indifference. Do you think that's why our world seems less compassionate this day? Do you think we've lost the courage to care? Do we keep a secret store of indifference as a sort of self-protection against getting hurt? Those are some questions that flow from our scripture lesson from Acts chapter 9 for this morning. It's the story of a remarkable disciple of Jesus Christ named Tabitha. Our story begins like this. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Someone once wrote that a truly great life can be summed up in just a few words. An epitaph of excellence. This is our introduction to Tabitha. She was always doing good and helping the poor. What a wonderful epitaph. Sadly, however, Tabitha became sick and evidently died before her time. The other disciples in Joppa were so upset about her death, that they sent for Simon Peter to come to them from a nearby town. As you remember, after Jesus' death, Peter became the leader of the Twelve Apostles. When Peter got to Tabitha's house, he was taken upstairs to the room where they had lain her body. Among the mourners in that upper room was a group of widows. Widows and orphans were the neediest members of society in Jesus' day. They were completely dependent on the help and compassion of others. Without help, many of the widows would have to turn to begging or prostitution to survive. These women were distraught. We read in Acts chapter 9, verse 39, All the widows stood around Peter, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing Tabitha had made while she was still with them. Evidently, Tabitha cared deeply for the widows' needs, and she showed her compassion for them by sewing clothing for them. She saw a practical need, and she filled it. Note that these women weren't just showing Peter the clothes that Tabitha made. They were showing Peter the love that Tabitha had for them. Tabitha was truly a caring woman. So having listened to the woman about the kind of woman Tabitha was, Peter sent them all out of the room, and he knelt beside the bed and prayed for Tabitha. And then he simply told her to get up. And Tabitha, whose body had already been washed and dressed for burial, opened her eyes and sat up. Whoa, surprise. Verses 41 and 42 read, Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. I'll bet that many of you had forgotten that Peter, by the power of God, raised Tabitha from the dead. What a remarkable story this is, and what a remarkable woman Tabitha must have been. She was so beloved and respected by her church family that she was brought back from the dead to continue, continue her ministry with them. Hers was compassion with a capital C. She truly lived her life walking in the steps of her master. She lived as Christ would have all of us live, with concern and compassion for her neighbor. But what I hope all of us will see today is that living like Tabitha lived, living with love and compassion for others, which, by the way, is the way Christ lived, is the only truly fulfilling way to live. You want the key to living at its best? A life of compassion is the key. Notice, first of all, that Tabitha lived with a sense of purpose. A sad thing is that so many people today live with no real purpose at all for their lives. Chuck Colson, Charles Colson, the founder of Prison Fellowship, had a healthy perspective on living a life of purpose. He was once a powerful attorney and political advisor to President Richard Nixon. He was also involved in the Watergate scandal that led to Nixon's impeachment. Colson spent seven months in prison for his role in the Watergate scandal. He suffered a loss of power, prestige, and money. But as a result, he became a Christian, a follower of Jesus in prison, and this gave him a new purpose in life. Subsequently, he founded an international prison ministry and wrote more than 30 books. He also became a popular speaker. He donated the proceeds from his book sales and speaking engagements to his ministry, Prison Fellowship. Charles Colson discovered what it meant to give up a life of power for a life of purpose. Colson once noted that his hometown of Naples, Florida is one of the best spots in the nation for golfing. He would see all these wealthy CEOs retire from their big corporation and moved to Naples so that they could spend all their time golfing. 
But a strange thing would happen in their retirement. These CEOs would begin measuring their days by how many games of golf they could play. And Colson asked some of these CEOs, do you really want to live your life counting up the number of times you chase that little white ball around these greens? And he said that these guys would laugh nervously at that question. That after a few months of golfing, he could see in their eyes that they were becoming bored, purposeless. They had discovered that there's no real joy in golfing every day. What looked like freedom and pleasure to them had become meaningless. Colson writes, the object of life is not what we think it is, which is to achieve money, power, pleasure. The object of life is the maturing of the soul. And you reflect that maturing of the soul when you care more for other people than yourself. Tabitha, a disciple of Jesus, cared for others. She understood that God had given her particular skills and resources she could use for good works. She had the skill of sewing that she could use to provide for the poor and for the widows. I challenge you to take some time this week to examine the skills and resources that God has given you. Then ask yourself how you can use these things to meet the needs of the people God places in your life. This is to say that the best way to find a fulfilling life is to translate compassion into action. Jesus' ministry didn't consist of simply telling hurting people, I'll pray for you. Now, there's nothing wrong with telling people that you'll pray for them. That can be very helpful, if you really mean it, and if you follow through with it. But there are some other people, there are other people who tell others that they will pray for them who simply use that as a substitute for doing anything else to help the person who is in need. That was not Jesus' way. Jesus never even told anyone to come to church to find the answers for their needs. Instead, he went to them. He went to the marketplaces and into people's homes. He preached to crowds in the countryside. He went where the needs were, and he took action to heal the hurts right in front of him. It always thrills me when young people find creative ways to live out their compassion. We're told that during the recent COVID-19 lockdown a while back, reports of domestic violence rose all over the world. Most of us feel great sympathy for victims of domestic violence, but few of us take direct action to improve their situation. However, a Polish high school student named Christina used her skills and resources to get help for people in dangerous home situations. She set up a fake online cosmetic store. Now listen carefully. Here's how this fake site worked. A woman shopping on this site could make a request for help without alerting her partner to her actions. If a woman places her order and types in an address, that is a sign that she needs a visit from the local authorities. Since the website's launch, this creative site has helped 350 women, including some teenagers, get help. Now, most of us are not creative enough to come up with something that effective in helping people with a specific need. But often, if we look hard enough, we can find some concrete deed we can do to reach out to show someone else the love of Jesus. Tabba, this, Tabitha, this truly caring woman, lived a fulfilling life. She had a sense of purpose for her life. She translated her compassion into action, and because of the kind of life she lived, she will live forever. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that because by the power of God, Peter raised her from the dead that she will live forever. Tabitha eventually did die. But think of it. Here we are in the year 2022, talking about a woman who lived 2,000 years ago. Why? Because of the caring life that she lived. What a legacy Tabitha left us. As long as people tell the gospel story, Tabitha will not be forgotten. Such is the power of a positive influence. It never dies. Let me tell you of one more woman who had Tabitha's kind of compassion. In 1977, Dr. Martha Myers moved to Yemen to serve as a doctor of obstetrics, obstetrics, obstetrics there we go, and gynecology. Her target audience was Yemeni women who often lacked medical care and because of their religion, were prohibited from seeing a male doctor. Myers worked at a Yemeni hospital founded by American Baptist, but she also traveled into the most remote areas around the hospital to make house calls for her patients. Her love and commitment earned her both admiration and enemies. One day, a patient of Dr. Myers told her husband that she had never experienced such love and compassion in her life as she did at Dr. Myers' hospital. That was the wrong thing to say to her husband. 
Concerned that his wife might be influenced by the doctor's Christian faith, her husband went promptly to the hospital and gunned down Dr. Myers and two of her colleagues. At the time of her death, Dr. Martha Myers had served the women of Yemen for more than 25 years. The result? Over 40,000 Yemeni people attended Dr. Myers' funeral. The former president of the Southern Baptist International Mission Board, Jerry Rankin, said, Martha's colleague said the gunman did not take her life. She lost her life to Christ years ago when she trusted him. Martha was not living for herself, but to serve others. For one moment, I want you to listen to this quote and put your name in it. She lost her life to Jesus Christ years ago when she trusted him. Martha was not living for herself, but to serve others. Does that describe your life right now? Is it how people will describe you after you're gone? You and I were made to be Jesus in the world. That means living with a sense of purpose and translating our compassion into action. And if we commit to living this way, then our lives will have an eternal impact as well. Until we meet again, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Amen.